Sam Dion. Hi. Do I have any time to uh, see my, to show my work? We've already had about three, four people talking. Uh, but uh, I'm very glad to be here, and I want to thank the Plastic Club and all the people involved uh, for uh, helping me uh, get this show together. And uh, so uh, that's about all I have to say. And uh, so we can start the show. I'm sure there's a lot of people watching at this moment. So uh, I hope everyone that uh, uh, is important, that I think is important uh, for me to see my work uh, because uh, a lot of people are involved. Okay, we ready? All right. Uh, you can put on the invitation first that Alan designed. Uh, this is uh, the design that uh, I asked Alan Clay once to, uh, there were two images and Alan Clay once decided to use this first image uh, as the uh, part of the invitation. And this is a close-up of Carly. Uh, I did a full painting of her, which you'll see later. But, uh, okay, so this is my uh, uh, last portrait that I did. Uh, when I turned 90, uh, I'm right, but as of February uh, 16, I turned 90, which, uh, you know, Alan Clayman says, uh, we hope that uh, uh, we'll have many future events that Sam will uh, exhibit, but I'm 90 years old already, you know? Give me a break. Anyway, uh, I did this in about 45 minutes. Uh, I like working with pastel. I've done pastels all my life, and uh, I kind of use it uh, uh, like watercolor, and I just swish around with it, and yeah, he's and, and it comes out. Took about 45, uh, about uh, three quarters of an hour for this one. Uh, next, uh, these are some sketches in from my sketchbook. Uh, one is a, a young girl, and the other one is my, on the right is my cousin Butch. Uh, when, um, when I was about three years old, uh, we all, we all uh, lived in Strawberry Mansion. That's where a lot of Jewish people settled, uh, coming from the old country, uh, from uh, Kiev, where my father came from, uh, uh, Russia, war, uh, you know, all over uh, Europe. A lot of Jews settled in Strawberry Mansion, uh, like a lot of Italians settled in South Philadelphia. Uh, so, uh, one day my grandfather, that's my mother's father, sat me on his lap and he proceeded to, he had a little pad, you know, about three by five or two by four, a lined pad of uh, paper. And he proceeded to do a drawing of a fish, the outline of a fish and the fins and the gill. And then he proceeded to put in all the, what are they? Scales. This, the what? Scales. The scales of a fish. And uh, took him about half an hour and he did a perfect drawing of a fish in pencil. And I was very inspired and, and remember that from the time I was about three or four years old. Next. Okay, now, this, uh, what happened was, uh, I started, uh, my parents sent me to a uh, school called the Stevens School of Practice when I was about nine or 10 years old. And it was on Spring Garden Street. I don't know if they drove me there or not. My father had what he called a machine. He called the car a machine, you know, just like a washing machine. Why not call a car a machine? So anyway, uh, I, I went to school, Stephen's School of Practice, 
and uh, there was a bust of Beethoven on a grand piano, and there was a lot of music involved and art. And so my parents must have known that I was pretty good at art. And uh, so uh, the teacher said, uh, one, why doesn't everybody do whatever they want for this uh, uh, one hour? So I asked the girl in the next row to turn around and pose for me, and I did a portrait of her or a sketch of her. 32 years later, my son, Alan, was bar mitzvah at Temple Judea, which is at the top of the North Broad Street near Cheltenham Avenue. And a congregant, a woman comes up to me and said, you did my, a sketch of me when we were 10 years old and I have it, still have it hanging on the wall now, framed. So that's how I started sketching people. Now, this painting of, uh, I did in pastel, it's bread, cheese, and wine. What happened was my parents moved to Atlantic City. Uh, they should have told me something. I was in school at the time. But anyway, we moved to Atlantic City, and they opened up an Italian restaurant. Jewish people opening up an Italian restaurant. It's a whole story on its own. And uh, uh, during that time, uh, I also sketched uh, the guy that uh, made signs for people on the boardwalk, uh, Nick Spagnola and his brother had a sketch place on the beach on, on a platform that was raised from the sand. And they had two or three easels that pivoted around. By this time, it was after uh, Pearl Harbor, and it was, uh, you know, after 1941, I was 12, 13, 14 years old, living in Atlantic City. I can't tell you what living in Atlantic City is like. It's incredible. Uh, you know, on the beach all the time, playing football with my friends. Uh, it's just uh, amazing. But anyway... I started doing sketches of people on the boardwalk for tips uh, from this place uh, that Nick Spagnola invited me to, to sketch. And uh, meanwhile, the, uh, the military took over a lot of the hotels and the convention center in Atlantic City so that there was a lot of military people on the boardwalk in uniform. And so I would do a fast sketch of them, roll up the paper, and uh, and they would uh, uh, throw down tips to me. And uh, after, you know, I would do this during the day. At night, I would be bussing dishes in my father's restaurant. And uh, so I would bring back, uh, at the end of the week, I would bring back like $20 in tips because usually a person would tip me maybe a quarter tops. And then, of course, the boss, Nick Spagnola, had to take half of what, what I had. So uh, I came back with like 20, 25 bucks for a whole week. And my father would say, this, this is no way to make a living. you got to work hard. This is not a way to make a living. Anyway, when uh, I was about... Uh, 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 when I got to high school, uh, I did I started doing some more pastels of uh, still lifes and so forth. And one day I decided to uh, borrow an Italian bread, a provolone cheese that my parents had uh, that the, the uh, uh, chefs would uh, cut up and a bottle of Chianti wine. And it's called bread, cheese and wine, with my, which my son, Alan, has had for a long time in his condo in Philly. And that won me a scholarship to the Philadelphia Museum School of Industrial Art, which became later the Philadelphia College of Art and then the University of the Arts. And I won a scholarship to the school uh, from high school from this painting in pastel that I did, bread, cheese, and wine. Next, this is my father. Uh, I'm, uh, I did a, 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 this portrait from a black and white photograph. I think my father was uh, about 65 
or my parents were celebrating their 60th anniversary. And Pop had a small photograph of him playing violin. He came from Kiev. And uh, uh, before World War I, and uh, uh, I'm not sure if he was married first to my mother, uh, but uh, uh, he volunteered for the army because when you volunteer for the army, I think it's the way it is now, you automatically became a citizen. So he volunteers for the army, gets shipped overseas, and uh, uh, falls out with the marching band somewhere overseas, someplace maybe they were occupying Germany. And uh, so the sergeant of the uh, marching band says, Dion, uh, what's, what instrument do you have? He says, I played a violin. Sergeant said, this is a marching band. You we don't have violins in a marching band. And this is giving you an idea who my father is. An incredible guy. He says, well, what do you need? And the sergeant says, we need clarinets. My father pulls out some money, I don't know what, gives it to the sergeant. He says, buy me a clarinet and I'll practice. And that's what he did. And he wound up playing a clarinet as best as he could for the marching band of the Rainbow Division of the Fighting 69th Army. Uh, most of the guys in the band were from New York, Irishmen. They were all Irish, playing big tubas and horns and everything. And there's a photograph of my father somewhere uh, holding the clarinet and the whole marching band of the Fighting 69th behind him. And then uh, when he uh, came to back to America, uh, he started teaching violin, and he taught uh, violin to my mother's brother, and that's how he met my mother. Next. Uh, so after I uh, finished art school, I automatically got drafted in the Army in August. And uh, I was still, uh, you know, I had about a month, I was still working in the uh, Italian restaurant. Anyway, I got drafted in the army and uh, I, I had my big duffel bag on me and uh, uh, I was stationed in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, home of the 11th Airborne Division. But I, on top of my duffel bag, I had a little portfolio. And, uh, you know, I first got there, I looked around and we had some time off. And I noticed there's a, a place called the Public Information Office, the PIO. So I go into the PIO when I had some time off. You know, if you walk around with a broom in the army, nobody says anything. You can go anywhere you want as they think you're doing something. So anyway, I go with a broom to the public information office, show them my portfolio, and I wind up doing these magic marker drawings of uh, guys uh, going to jump school and learning how to be parachutists in the army and this is in Kentucky and they would send them uh, to uh, what was the name of that place where the uh, to uh, what's next to Kentucky uh, wherever and they would put them on television to uh, advertise uh, the Fort Campbell uh, uh, parachutes and so if any Body wanted to go to jump school, they would see an advertisement on television. And that's what we did in the public information office. Anyway, uh, in about uh, 1956, I met this girl, her name was, uh, I went on a blind date with, with uh, Irv Portner, uh, my friend Alan Portner's brother, who should be in this uh, Zoom thing. And I roomed with Alan Portner's brother, Irv Portner. He was a little older than, than me. And uh, he was working for uh, the Yellow Pages. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, he asked me, uh, maybe I can get a job there, which I did. So I started doing work for the Yellow Pages, which in those days was like Google. You know, the Yellow Pages is about two inches thick. And uh, you could, they had a lot of ads in there for this, that, and the other thing. And so uh, I worked with Irv. In fact, we, we shared an apartment together. And Irv was going with a girl from WPEN, a secretary, it was an AM radio station. I uh, had news and music. And uh, uh, one of the other girls that worked there was a girl named Gloria Teblum. And her parents had a, an, a lingerie store in South Philadelphia. So uh, uh, I started dating Gloria. And at that, about that time, I, I learned how to drive. I learned how to drive late. But anyway, I bought, I bought the uncle, my uncle, uh, my brother-in-law Vic's car and uh, 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 Pontiac. And uh, so I would pick Lori up from her mother, from her parents' place. And I had to wait for her outside because it was a women's, uh, you know, apparel. And so we would go on dates. And uh, one time we went to see Chet Baker uh, at, uh, at a club uh, on... Uh, on South Street, and he was playing My Funny Valentine, which we all would remember. And so one day I said to Gloria, why don't you come up to the apartment and I'll do your portrait. And so she, she said, okay. So she comes up to my apartment. Now can you imagine a guy with this beautiful girl inviting, him, inviting her up to his apartment and he winds up doing a portrait. These guys are crazy. Artists are crazy. Anyway, do you think that was funny, Alan? <laughs> anyway, I did Gloria's portrait in 1956. And in nine, and, and on uh, at December 29th, 1957, uh, I, uh, she got married, but not to me. She married a guy named Steve Cohen who was an optician, I mean, a, an optician, I beg your pardon. Steve Cohen was an optician. His father was an optician. And she uh, married Steve Cohen. And uh, his father had a place in town. And finally, uh, the uh, optimist Steve Cohen uh, had a place up near, uh, uh, in the suburbs. Uh, next. Oh, we got a technical issue here. It's not moving ahead. There we go. Oh, okay. Next, uh, I uh, dated this woman. She didn't look like this when I met her. I met her in an elevator. Uh, I was working uh, uh, for a, 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 an agency, the Leonard Feldman Advertising Agency in the old Bolton building uh, next to City Hall. And uh, uh, Sylvia Bellows, was a secretary for some lawyers there, and we met in an elevator. Uh, this painting I did uh, 20 years later of her from a drawing she posed for me, and it was the first time I did a bas relief using foam core and, uh, and uh, acrylic paint and all kinds of acrylic medium to uh, do this. And I also cast a shadow in paint. So it looked like it was being lit up from the right side. Next, this is White Marsh Village in Winmar. This is where we raised our family. This is where Sylvia and I raised our family in, uh, in, in, uh, in Winmar. And uh, uh, this uh, painting I did from our deck in acrylic in 1965, uh, it was about uh, eight years after, uh, well, no, we moved there about six years later uh, after we got married. We were in, uh, in a couple of other places, met a lot of other people. Uh, so I entered this into uh, the uh, Chestnut Hill Street Show, which is sponsored by the Woodmere Art Museum, and it wins first prize. And Sid Goodman's wife, uh, Eileen Goodman, who was 
had her stand right next to me, wins best of show. And that's what happened on uh, at the uh, show at, on the street show in Chestnut Hill. Uh, then I started doing work. Uh, uh, I uh, moved to a studio, and Alan uh, Clemens, you might remember, you might recognize this guy, Bob Parker. Didn't he? Wasn't he an art director at Smith Klein? He's mute. Yeah, he's saying yeah. Well, anyway, I, uh, I I worked in a studio with Les Goldstein and Len Cohen. Len Cohen was a photographer. He did fashion illustration. Les Goldstein and I uh, worked near the front windows. We had a uh, our own separation, and Les did a lot of uh, dr uh, uh, book illustrations, uh, children book illustrations. And I started doing uh, uh, work for the Pennsylvania Lottery and also for the Delaware Lottery. And this is a painting I did uh, uh, in watercolor that the Delaware Lottery had on their buses in Delaware. Next. These are some storyboards I did for Lewis and Gilman. Uh, and uh, I would uh, do these storyboards, uh, to, you know, turn them overnight in magic marker. Uh, it turned out to be the king of magic marker. I could do magic marker like watercolors. And it was all for the Pennsylvania Lottery and uh, Lewis and Gilman, the biggest agency in Philadelphia had that account. And uh, I would work maybe a couple of days and then either have an agent that would, uh, or a, a, uh, a delivery service that would deliver it from my house, or I would go and uh, uh, in town and deliver it myself and then get some, another uh, uh, problem. And they usually put these on uh, television as they were for the client to look at uh, with sound of the actors reading the lines and then if the client liked it, uh, they would go to uh, actors to do these uh, really stupid commercials. And uh, the next, oh, and then I was working at uh, Goodway Printing Company. Uh, I slowed down for a while and uh, I was working at Goodway, which is in, uh, which was on, uh, uh, Route 1 uh, on Roosevelt Boulevard, way up there. But uh, in the meantime, I was doing men's and boys' wear for Rock Hour Brothers. I was working at, at uh, uh, this other place, and uh, I started doing men's and boys' wear with bell-bottom trousers. And it turns out my sons, Alan and Jeff, were 8 and 10 years old. They were perfect models. So they, would, they would give me the, the uh, clothes. And my sons and their friends would uh, put the clothes on. I would take Polaroids, black and white Polaroids of them, and turn them into uh, fashion models with bell-bottom trousers and, uh, and also menswear. Can you imagine doing, uh, and, and uh, Wolk, it was uh, uh, Rocco Brothers, was a men's and boys wear department for Wolko department stores. Can you imagine doing a, a selling a suit for thirty nine ninety nine with a vest uh, at Woolco Departments, which are all on the east coast of uh, of the United States? Yeah, and that I'm I'm the one with the full head of hair there. Oh yeah, <laughs> on, on the right side. Uh, okay, so then uh, as I was working at Goodway. Uh, they had a big printing plant. Uh, they started, the father started a long time ago, and I, when I first uh, started working for them in 1968, uh, I did a portrait of their, of their father, so they decided to have me paint all the printing presses uh, in the bottom floor. And this one is called Web Press Back View, which turned out to I entered that in the New York Society of Illustrators show a few years later. 
In fact, it was after I left Goodway, but also uh, they were doing album covers. And I did this album cover for them uh, for the silhouettes called Get a Job. And since it was called Get a Job, sha da da da, sha da 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 da, get a job, uh, I did it with uh, as a, a montage of one ads from the newspapers. So all four faces, if you can see the fourth face, uh, are all done with one ads from newspapers for the silhouettes called Get a Job. Uh, then we go back to when I was in art school and I did a, uh, these were themes that I decided to use in my senior year of jazz musicians. The one on the right is of Charlie Parker, which I did in pen and ink and then added crayon. It's done in pen and ink and crayon of Charlie Yardbird Parker. And the one on the right, uh, which was loaned to me by Mary Harris. I hope she's listening or watching. Uh, she uh, uh, sent this to me online and we put this in the show. It's of a bass player. Uh, I'm not sure who the musician is. And uh, that was part of my theme of uh, jazz musicians in my senior year. Uh, and in 1962, I wound up doing a uh, a story, uh, this was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, the uh, Curtis Publishing Company calls me, uh, the art director of the Curtis Publishing Company of the Saturday Evening Post calls me and said, we're doing a story about the Cuban Missile Crisis and it's probably going to be inside the Saturday Evening Post and we want you to do a drawing of Kennedy and Khrushchev looking at each other, staring at each other, because the headline will be, we're eyeball the eyeball, and I think the other fellow just blinked. So I did these two sketches, and in those days, you would go to the, the, uh, the big public library in Philadelphia to the print and picture department. It was like Google is today. Uh, you can go for Google, you get anything you want. Well, the print and picture department at the big public library in the parkway, all the illustrators, all the artists who needed reference would go there. And uh, I, I would say what I wanted, the woman would come back from a hundred million files of everything they had. And I had plenty of pictures of, of uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev during the, Mu uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. So I did the sketches and I had it mailed uh, uh, via a, a messenger to New York City, where the Saturday Evening Post had moved to. So about a week later, uh, I, I called the Curtis Publishing Company and I said, could I have the printing department? And they said, sure. So I get the printing department and I asked the printer, I said, what's the, uh, I had a feeling that it was going to be more than an inside cover because this was this was the Cuban Missile Crisis. And he said, uh, it's a, a picture of Kennedy and Khrushchev looking at each other. And uh, I said, well, uh, uh, what's the name on, on the bottom right side? And they said, Dion. I said, I want 100 copies sent to my studio on 18th Street, which they sent to me. And I, I got the 100 copies. This is what you did when you mailed out your work to various clients. I had a hundred copies. I walked in the studio and put them one and after the other to my drawing table. So when the other guys came in, they saw a hundred copies of the Cuban Missile Crisis to my desk. And uh, how many did you do? Oh, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, the other thing is this guy uh, Norman. I forgot his last name. Rockport or Still, well, uh, Norman, uh, I think it was, what is his name? Rockwell, yes. Norman Rockwell uh, did, it uh, turns out he did uh, 322 Saturday evening post covers. I did one, and that's it. <laughs> then we go back to Napoleon. 
this is very apropos today because this was done when Alan Claywoods was art director of Smith Klein. He asked me to do three paintings, one of George Washington crossing in Delaware, the, one, the other one of Hannibal on a, an elephant uh, crossing the Alps and, uh, and Napoleon retreating from Moscow. And they're all blowing their noses because they knew that the Jerry Colonna virus was going to be coming. And uh, so they were all had, pretending to have colds for the uh, pharmaceutical, for the pharmaceuticals for Smith Klein Corporation. And that was done in acrylic. It was a big, three big paintings. And uh, then I started doing work for the Franklin Mint. Uh, and uh, I did hundreds of these drawings in black and white, uh, cross hatch. And uh, today you can press a button uh, and you could get cross hatch technique. Uh, uh, but in those days you had to do it by hand. And I did hundreds of drawings of famous artists and other famous people, uh, some in color, but these were all done black and white cross hatch. Uh, Winslow Homer and uh, Rembrandt. Uh, next, uh, uh, more, uh, this was uh, I did for Macmillan Publishing uh, when I was working at uh, uh, the studio. Uh, I did uh, a half a dozen uh, paintings of famous writers and poets, and this is one of uh, Mark Twain. And what you do, uh, just like any other professional artist, you have to send in uh, sketches first, and then they approve them. And so the final, these are the, uh, one of the final editions done in acrylic of uh, famous uh, writers and poets for um, Macmillan Publishing. Then I started doing work for Philadelphia Magazine. I became their atrocity artist. This is a double page spread. And on the left hand side, as it was called the Caesarian murder case. And uh, it was a story in Philadelphia Magazine about a, a woman who murdered a pregnant woman and uh, did a Caesarian operation on her. And uh, the woman, the uh, pregnant woman, died, and and uh, was uh, the 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 killer, the murderer, uh, hid her under the floorboards of her house. This is in Frankfurt, and uh, uh, you can see where they met originally at Sandy J, which is a uh, a, a woman's store. Anyway, after that, I started doing. Uh, uh, drawings uh, and uh, for uh, uh, for uh, what Philadelphia for Philadelphia magazine uh, for courtroom drawings and I, I did murder scenes uh, murder uh, uh, of uh, murderers for uh, in courtroom drawings I did one of uh, a guy who killed two people for uh, a, a guy who had a nightclub on Chestnut Street, and he hired Frank the Hatchet Phelan, a perfect name. He looked just like Burt Lancaster with sunglasses. And I was right up there at the front row, and I did a, a sketch of, a really good sketch of Frank the Hatchet Phelan, who murdered these two people. One was a partner, and the other was the uh, partner's wife. And uh, uh, after it was published, uh, Frank the Hatchet Phelan's mother calls Philadelphia Magazine to compliment them on what a, a very good likeness that I did of Frank the Hatchet Phelan, who looked just like Bert, Bert Lancaster. And I did a lot of work for a Philadelphia Magazine, mainly, mainly of uh, murders, uh, well, a girl in the back of a trunk on the main line, and so forth. Anyway, Oh, yeah. uh, this is a, 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 a watercolor I did. It's called A Dark Path. 
and uh, it's uh, it was during the time that I was uh, and my wife Sylvia were getting a divorce, and the title is a dark path, and uh, it, uh, it the this print is a little lighter than the original, but uh, uh, that's what I was going through, and both families were going through at the same time. And uh, after I married Gloria, who uh, uh, also divorced her husband, Steve, the optimist, uh, the optician, uh, we got married on the same, oh, uh, about 25 years later. And uh, Gloria got a, uh, she got her PhD, PhD at Temple University and started teaching uh, at Bloomsburg University, she taught political science, and in a couple of years, she became head of the political science department. She was a great teacher, and she knew what to say to her students, to her fellow uh, teachers, and uh, to even to the 14 state colleges. She just knew exactly what to say, uh, and uh, so. Uh, one time we took a train across the Canadian Alps, uh, started out from Washington State, took a bus to a train, which crossed the Canadian Alps in two days. So we were on this train overnight, crossing the Alps. We had our own car, uh, bunk beds, and our own bathroom. It was fabulous. And the train would stop two or three times a day and we would see what's going on outside and there were shows for us and people, there were things prepared for the train as it stopped by. Uh, one time the train stopped to pick up one passenger and uh, there were some kids outside the train and they mooned us as the train stopped. These are kids from Canada. Anyway, uh, the train finally wound up near uh, Montreal, and then we took a bus from there to Montreal. And this is a sketch I did on the napkins that we had. And that's why it's called Jazz on a Napkin, because we went to Beatles Jazz Club, which you can see Glory and two people holding hands and a woman in the background uh, playing a clarinet. It's called Biddle's Jazz, Jazz on a Napkin. And this is the first painting I did after I moved to Bloomsburg. Gloria moved there a half a year earlier to start teaching uh, in, the, in the spring or the fall. And I moved there in 1994. And the first painting I did was this painting looking down from the college. I did it in acrylic and uh, I would put my, I put my easel right in the middle of the street. This is done from life. And uh, except for the girl walking across, I saw, I saw uh, somebody walking across and I had my camera and I took a picture of her. I put her in later, uh, but this, also won first prize at the Woodmere Art Museum in 1998. And Gloria just loved it and invited her family to come over and see it. And uh, also, uh, this is the upper campus of Bloomsburg University. Uh, and it's really, it's like a 15 uh, incline, 15 foot incline to go up to upper campus uh, and uh, up uh, on upper campus, I had the football stadium, the girls' uh, softball field, and a track team, the track field, and everything was all on the upper campus. And you could see the Allegheny Mountains in the background. And uh, when I went up there, uh, I, I took uh, a picture of this girl being uh, taken off the field because uh, uh, she must have broken her ankle. And uh, I added these other girls playing uh, soccer because I could care less about her. They were only interested in uh, winning the game. And uh, I gave that, by the way, to uh, one of the Cohen families. 
Uh, this is another painting I did. Uh, it's a practice wall in, in the park in Bloomsburg. You see a guy playing tennis on the right. And uh, I uh, walked by this practice wall one day and uh, I said, gee, that would make a good uh, painting because in the early morning light, you saw that red highlight on the left side of the wall coming from the sun. And so I went out there for two or three days and painted the red practice wall. And eventually uh, it was exhibited in two shows. One show was a, a show uh, from a magazine that was listed every show in the country. And I entered this show in one of those shows. And it was picked out of 10 that went to California for a show uh, in California. So we had to pack it up in a crate and send us a big painting, uh, well, 31 by 28, I think it was bigger than that, and uh, send it to California. And then it came back and I entered it. I was a member of a of another group called the, uh, called the um, what was the name of that group? Art, Art. The, the Early Mountain Art group show and uh, they had so I entered it in that show and uh, the uh, the guy in charge said you know it looks like uh, what you have here is a memorial or, or it looks like a headstone for a, um, for a, uh, a memorial for somebody and it turned out that my wife Sylvia's funeral was three weeks before I did this painting and I went to her funeral. I wasn't invited because uh, we have been both separated for a long time. And three weeks after her funeral, I did this painting. Now, my wife, Sylvia, was a redhead. And somehow, the a guy in charge said it looks like a memorial to somebody. It looks like a headstone about in a graveyard. And that's what happened. And there's also a, 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 a this is a coal counterattack and there's a, a diner in Bloomsburg, a very popular place. And these guys were there every morning. The same guys used to come in to this diner every morning. And uh, Sylvia, uh, Gloria and I were there uh, one morning. And uh, so I took a lot of photographs and I created this painting in acrylic. And then eventually uh, I put Gloria coming in on, uh, on the left. And it's completely opposite from the next drawing that you'll see which is the a master drawing of the Bloomsburg Diner. You can see a, a horizon line of the people's eyes sitting on the booths. And the uh, vanishing point is at the extreme end of, of this master drawing I did. And I, I always thought that just showing this as a, as a as a, a, a master drawing of, of uh, horizon line and perspective is a good example of that. And uh, also, uh, this is called Pennsylvania Gothic. These two people came out in their truck every weekend. Well, from Thursday to Friday and Saturday, they would come out with their truck and, and on Market Street, they would put out all their produce that, that that came from about a uh, you know a half uh, an hour away and uh, I, I did a, a number of paintings and Mary Harris has uh, two or three watercolors uh, that I did of uh, of uh, people uh, who uh, brought their produce to Bloomsburg and I call it Pennsylvania Gothic it's not like American Gothic because the guy was holding a pitchfork and there was a church behind him. But these people's church was their truck, as you can see right in the middle behind them, which they uh, 
used to bring their produce from their farm to Bloomsburg. And uh, this is, I did, uh, I belong to the Rotary Club in Bloomsburg and the uh, chief of the fire department asked me to do four drawings of the old firehouses, which was, were on various streets, uh, little streets, a big highway. They were at four different firehouses. Each one had its own personality. So I did four preliminary sketches first for the fire department, which is the way uh, professionals work. And they saw the preliminary sketches. These are two of the finals. And they agreed they liked them all. So uh, I was uh, going to do the four finishes because they were going to, at the time, they were building one big firehouse uh, on the end of Market Street near the Allegheny River, near La Park. But at that time, I had a tremor in my, my right hand. I always had a tremor since I moved to Bloomsburg. But my hand was shaking even a little more. And so uh, I was concerned and I put off doing these drawings. And one day I saw a story of, of Charles Schultz doing peanuts and he had a tremor in his right hand and the drawings of peanuts when he ended up doing them from the beginning when he started before he had a tremor, the tr the peanuts that he drew later on were better. Even, what's her name? You know, the girl. Uh, Lucy. Huh? Lucy. Lucy, yeah. Her smile was even better because it had a tremor that Charles Schultz did. And so I looked at the, this show on television and I said, Jesus, if he can do the peanuts, I, I can do these four firehouses. And I did all four. In fact, I did the fifth one, and uh, which looked like a factory. It didn't have any personality at all. And so I had a guy put on uh, his fire uniform and raise the Bloomsburg and the American flag, which made it a little more interesting. And they sold all, they did 500 copies of each and sold each one for 20 bucks uh, in the firehouse. Uh, uh, to help uh, the uh, firehouse company. And this is Carly. It's hard for me to talk about this. But anyway, I did Carly Lee Lamcher when she was 11 years old. And um, her mother worked, uh, she, her mother taught at Bloomsburg University and was a good friend of Gloria. And uh, her mother taught the philosophy at Bloomsburg University. And uh, I did this when Carly was 11 years old from life. And she posed two or three days and uh, she was going through puberty. And eventually she went to IUP at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, and she graduated with honors. Gloria and I were there, and uh, for the graduation, took pictures, and uh, and then Carly volunteered for the Peace Corps. She was about I don't know, 24 years old, maybe less, maybe 22 years old. This beautiful blonde volunteered for the Peace Corps. And she and a hundred other people went to uh, to the Ukraine. Uh, they were sent, a hunch, Carly and, and a hundred of her Peace Corps members were sent to Ukraine. And she taught in a little village somewhere near Kiev. And they loved her. She was this beautiful blonde. She taught English to, to uh, uh, Ukrainian and Russian people. And uh, they couldn't love her anymore. Uh, it was just incredible. They gave her a house to live in. 
and she was teaching English at about, she was about 22 years old, maybe 23. And uh, about six months later, Russia invaded Ukraine. And in 24 hours, all of the 100 Ukrainian uh, Peace Corps members had to come back to the United States. And Carly wound up in Colorado in the in AmeriCorps. She wound up in AmeriCorps. And she got involved with some other people. AmeriCorps doesn't pay as much money as a Peace Corps did. And she, uh, one time I was walking through the college to go downtown and Carly calls me. She said, uh, I'm here and I have a boyfriend. Uh, I live in, in Colorado and uh, he's Jewish. I said, what's his name? I, and she told me his name. I said, he's Jewish? She said, yes. I said, could I talk to him? Uh, she said, sure. So Carly puts her boyfriend on. I said, uh, I forgot what his name is, but I said to him, uh, do you know that you're living with a shiksa? He said, what's a shitska? I said, not shitska, shiksa, like the shik razor blade. You're living with a shiksa. He didn't know what a shiksa was. These are Jewish people from Colorado. <laughs> okay, then uh, one day, uh, 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 Susan is uh, uh, at a, a, a get together for uh, new uh, members of the faculty and uh, she's talking to my wife and uh, I kind of liked the way she looked and uh, I thought she would make a good model uh, and uh, so uh, Susan uh, uh, this is one of the first watercolors uh, that I, I did of her. Uh, and uh, uh, she uh, is a, a, an incredible woman. She is a, a she is a kayaker. She takes people on kayak trips down the Allegheny River. She skis. She's a runner. And, uh, and she also is a, a writer for the Press Enterprise. She graduated in, uh, in uh, you know, writing. Uh, what do they call it, Jeff? English? Yeah, so she became a writer and uh, she came to uh, Bloomsburg and uh, started writing for the Press Enterprise. And the first time she posed for me, she said, I can't pose, there's an accident on Route 80 and you'll have, excuse me, but I have to cover this accident. So this painting I did is uh, includes a paper with the story about the accident she had to cover. And this was exhibited in the Philadelphia Sketch Club, the first uh, watercolor I did of her. And this is another watercolor I did of Susan. Uh, there was a, a program, there was a program on television called Suddenly Susan a TV show, a kind of a humorous show called Suddenly Susan. And uh, uh, the uh, London Opera Company was scheduled to come to Bloomsburg to put on an opera called Carmen. So I had Susan pose in the studio and uh, Gloria loaned her Susan didn't never never wears makeup, no earrings, no bracelets, nothing. Uh, she uh, no lipstick, so uh, uh, we had to give her uh, loan her earrings. Glory loaned her earrings and bracelets and everything, and I uh, had her pose and and titled it suddenly Carmen. And when the show came to Bloomsburg, the London. Uh, opera company in this big auditorium uh, in the lobby they had this on an easel and uh, it's called Suddenly Carmen and we invited Susan and her boyfriend Leon who has 
she's been living with now for over 20 years to uh, watch Carmen. And Susan uh, never knew about opera. She knew about kazachkas and doing all kinds of uh, dances other than, than or square dancing and all kinds of things. But uh, she never knew about opera. And so we invited her and Leon to sit with us. And uh, at the beginning of the opera of Carmen, you know, the peasants come out and they're singing and dancing and so forth. And then Carmen, who works in this factory, comes out and starts prancing in the front and she looked just like this Susan. <laughs> she looked just like this watercolor bit of Susan called suddenly Carmen and Susan flipped. Next. Uh, Susan also was a member of the early music ensemble. She played an early music instrument. So uh, they used to practice every other week in each other's homes. And then they would, uh, they would play at various other functions. Uh, so uh, they, I invited them to practice in the studio. And uh, I was on a platform and I took Polaroids of them uh, practicing. And the empty chair, once again, is where Susan would have been. But she had to cover another accident on Route 80. So this is a painting of watercolor I did from Polaroids of uh, all the members of the early music ensemble, including head of the English department on the right side. Next, now we finally find Susan and Jeffrey says talk a little bit less. Uh, anyway, this is the full uh, group of the early music ensemble and this is done in acrylic. And Susan is playing a wooden instrument uh, that looks like a, 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 a flute. And uh, so that's the early music ensemble. Next. Uh, now, finally, Susan is posing uh, with uh, less clothes on. And the one on the left I did of her putting up her hair. And it's charcoal drawing I did from life. And I, I, didn't, I didn't erase the mistakes I made because it's part of, the, uh, part of what a drawing does. You see the mistakes. It's part of the history of that drawing. And uh, that was exhibited next to a grand piano at the Woodbeer Art Museum in 1999. And the one on the left is a photograph I took of Susan passing her mirror uh, and uh, which was on top of her bureau, and she had a little stuff, a lot of stuffed animals, and a, a timer clock for for the uh, when she plays, when she practices her instrument, is on there also. And that's a painting. I just, I guess, I sold it because I, I don't know who has it. I don't have that. And this is the. Best painting I did of Susan. I always wanted to do it for shortening, like um, uh, I Monet did uh, of, of uh, 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 bullfighters. He did a foreshortened version of a bullfighter uh, lying on the ground. And I was inspired by a, a, a sculptor. Uh, when Gloria and I went to uh, uh, London to the Tate Gallery, uh, on another room, there were sculptures, and there was one of a sculpture of this woman lying down. She wasn't reading, so it inspired me to do a short, for shortened version of Susan. And this is right in my studio. And she, I, uh, the name of this is Great Truth Stories of Crime, Mister and Detection, which is a a, a Reader's Digest condensed novel that she's reading that I happened to illustrate. I illustrated the condensed novel of great crime, truth stories, and detection for Reader's Digest, and I told her to read it. And this won the Edith Emerson Founders Award at the Woodmere Art Museum. Now, the only other guy I know that won a Founders Award is Alan Claywins. He also won the Founders Award of, of one of his designs uh, at the Woodmere Art Museum. 
And one time, uh, Gloria and I were going uh, up to visit uh, a guy I went to art school with uh, in Maine, uh, Chuck Olson. Uh, he wound up in Maine. And uh, so uh, we stopped at Kenny Bungport. And in those days, uh, in Kenny Bungport, they didn't have uh, air conditioning. We stopped at a bed and breakfast. And so I woke up 2 o'clock in the morning. Gloria's sleeping. And uh, I put two, my, my watercolors out and did this watercolor of Gloria sleeping 2 a.m. at a bed and breakfast in Cunning Bunkport. And it was one of the best watercolors I ever did. And after Gloria died, suddenly in class in 19... <sighs> in 2013... Gloria died in class of a brain hemorrhage. And uh, about six months after she died, uh, I took out, I did four paintings of her. The one on the right, she loved to wear, she loved to collect beautiful hats. And occasionally she would wear one. She usually didn't wear one when she taught at school. Uh, uh, as you can see, these boxes that she collected are beautiful of her hats. One is a Bombwood Teller, which is a place in Philadelphia that sold hats. And uh, I did a, a collage of all her makeup before uh, uh, Judy, my daughter, and, and Gloria's uh, daughter-in-law, Barbara, came to the house and took everything away uh, and started selling things on the street. And so I did this collage uh, on, a, on the dining room table with a tablecloth of all her makeup. And then I had Mike Zarrett, who has a, ta a place called Town Camera. He sells cameras and so forth. I had him put Gloria's image in the, in the mirror. And uh, that's... Uh, it's uh, well, Gloria's makeup, a, a, a collage of Gloria's makeup and all the things that she used because she had to look perfect when she taught class. She had to look perfect. I would come down and make breakfast in the morning and Gloria would walk down, not say anything, and I would look around and, you know, she, I should make sure that I knew that she looked perfect before she went to school. Uh, and anyway, this is a McNally's bar, and uh, which is a very popular place in Chestnut Hill. And uh, on the right side is a chef that uh, worked for McNally for a couple of years. And I did a pastel of him before he quit. He had to go back. He was a foreigner, worked at McNally's. And uh, this is an acrylic of McNally's bar. And uh, it was one of uh, three paintings that I did for a book of, uh, of people that uh, went to uh, uh, Philadelphia College of Art, uh, which is called uh, the University of Arts. So when this was pub book was published, it's about faculty and student members uh, that went to the Philadelphia College of Art, and they picked this one to be a uh, part of that book at McNally's. Uh, when I got back to Philadelphia, uh, first thing I did was walk up to the diner, which is about three blocks up on, uh, what's the name of that street? Ridge Avenue. Ridge Avenue. Bob Diner Room. It's a very loud place, and uh, most of the... Uh, noise comes from uh, the people that work there. Uh, but there was this uh, cute little, very quiet girl, she's about 16 years old, and she would serve second cups of coffee and she'd work in the kitchen, and her name was Morgan. So I said, Morgan, uh, why don't you, uh, I think you should add an A to your name and call you Morgana, I think it's more feminine. She said, I, I know a lot of my girlfriends call me Morgana. So I said, Morgana, would you serve me, pr pretend you're serving me a cup of coffee? And I took pictures of her 
and I gave her, this is a pastel, and I gave her a print of that. And uh, then I started doing work at Starbucks. Starbucks was about three blocks away. And uh, I would go there with my sketchbook and uh, Conti crayons and a couple pastels. And uh, I would do these pastels of people pressing buttons on their laptops. They didn't even know I existed. Sometimes I wouldn't even order coffee. And I did hundreds and hundreds of these pastels in my sketchbooks. And the woman on the left that just so happens was reading a book. So I did a better drawing of her. And uh, she looked at it. And uh, I held it up and, you know, when you hold up a drawing, uh, they take a picture of it and then it goes all over the world. And she came back with a $25 gift certificate for me for Starbucks coffee. She was waiting there for her grandchildren. Uh, this is, uh, this is Sebi. This is when he was 15 and 16 years old, Sebastian, Jeffrey's. Jeffrey's son, and it just turns out that today is his 18th birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sebi. Happy birthday to you. These are two drawings I did of him. And he turned 18 today. And this is what my closet looks like. Well, my drawers are closed. But the uh, closet has no doors to it. So I decided to do a painting of my closet. What else is an artist going to do in his bedroom? So I did that in my closet. And this one is a painting. It's called Indian Queen Lane. Now, if you went down Indian Queen Lane, you would think it would be a beautiful street. But it turns out that it's a really ugly street with this gigantic tie, uh, electric tower and a, it's a train track going by and uh, two or three houses there where people live in their cars are parked. But at the bottom of Indian Queen, Indian Queen Lane is La Bus. This is the original La Bus where uh, it originally started as a bus at University of Pennsylvania and it became Le Bus and it's at the bottom of Indian Queen Lane. It's closed right now. But I took this painting off because they were sanding the floors down because of the coronavirus. And eventually they would open up or sell food uh, individually. And this is from our house at uh, Dexter Street. I did the sky first uh, and then the houses and then and this is in the winter time, and I put the, house, the trees in afterwards. This is on Dexter Street, where I live now with Jeff. And it's a beautiful porch. The painting on the left, it's called Across the Street. And there's this bush, bush that is taking over two signs. One's a handicap sign. And every spring, this bush uh, comes up, and it takes over the sign, and eventually, it's going to block the whole sign. One is a handicap sign, and the bottom one is a regular street sign of the hours you're allowed to park. My car is on the left, and the guy who's handicapped car is on the right. And this is our porch looking out into the park across the street from Dexter Street. And uh, this is uh, the house, uh, the, the house. It's a call, it's a water call, it's called line and wash. And I did a water call and then I included the line work of the structure of the house afterwards. And the first drawing, the first painting I did in acrylic or in pastel is from the studio of the first winter that I saw from Jeff's house from the studio since I've been living there since 2016. And this is the interior of the living room of our house. This is a watercolor. And Jeff has two cats. One is the, the male cat is called Dom Manuel. And she's looking out at the window, which she likes to do from our sofa. It's a watercolor on paper, 20 by 30. And this is a yes. back to 
Bloomsburg. This is a Maxwell House landscape because I put the painting and that can of Maxwell House where I put my brushes in, I put it in the picture itself because I, I, I don't know, it didn't seem like it was good enough. So I added the canvas, the painting, and the brushes, and the Maxwell House can of coffee where I put my brushes in. This is a photograph of me in the park the first time I was doing a painting. I had my brushes there, my acrylics, and I think I'm doing an acrylic painting. And this is a self-portrait of me, the first, before I moved to Bloomsburg, this was done before I met Gloria in Bloomsburg, I had time at the apartment that we were sharing. And uh, this is a pastel of me uh, in 94 and moved, before I moved to Bloomsburg. You notice I have a bigger stomach there. <laughs> before we go, I have one last thing to say, which is that um, if you go on the Plastic Club website, you'll see an extensive slideshow of Sam's work. And you also see a video of Sam made by his grandson, Noah Cohen. So uh, what you saw today was some of um, Sam's work, but there's more on the website. So be sure to visit.